Hey friends, welcome back to Sinai Design Study. We're now in session 21. In the last uh, handful of previous sessions, we looked at multiple passages in Moses, in the Pentateuch, as well as throughout the prophets that repeatedly reiterate the fact that Israel's national salvation, the remnant of Israel, when they all come to the Lord, that that grand event is intricately intertwined with Israel's restoration, their permanent restoration to the land. And so the scriptures clearly speak in the last days of a national revival among the Jews that are left at the end of Jacob's trouble and their permanent restoration to the land under the headship of Jesus the Messiah. Now, whenever we talk about this, it's very natural for people who are pro-Israel, of which I am, um, who live in the land of Israel, to say, well, hold on. What about the recent reestablishment of the state of Israel in 1948, the current state of Israel? Are there any scriptures that prophesy concerning Israel's restoration? And the answer is yes, there are. Um, but before we discuss those, I want to discuss three particular passages that are repeatedly, continually cited, and in their reference to say these passages have been fulfilled with the recent reestablishment of the state of Israel. So the three passages are Isaiah 11, Jeremiah 16, and Jeremiah 23. And there's others as well, but these are the three primary ones. There's also actually one in Ezekiel. But what these passages say is they say, the Lord in the last days will restore Israel to the land a second time. A second time. So what people do is they say, okay, so Israel was invaded, destroyed, and scattered, uh, spread out among the nations, ultimately to Babylon, under the Babylonian invasion. We read that whole story in Scripture, and then, of course, after Daniel's 70 weeks, um, the remnant that are left return to the land. They begin to rebuild under Ezra, and Nehemiah, and the whole post-exilic period, right? So then what people say is they go, well, so then the Roman invasion, destruction of Jerusalem, and exile of the Jewish people, and then 2000, roughly 2,000 years later, they returned. That was the second time. So the logic is very simple. This is clearly the second time, thus these passages must be speaking of Israel's recent, I say relatively recent, return to the land. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at these three passages, and let's just ask ourselves if the text itself, if the content of the text allows for this view that these prophecies, these passages, are actually speaking of the present-day modern reestablishment of the state of Israel. And what we'll see is actually these are just saying the same thing that all of the other previous prophecies spoke of. They're not talking about the most recent reestablishment of the state of Israel, and the reason is because the recent reestablishment of Israel was not done in full belief. It was not done under the headship of the Messiah. It was, as we've discussed previously, largely a secular return to the land as a response to the Holocaust. It's not to say there were not believers in the mix, but by and large, this was not a national revival and reestablishment of the, of the land, return to the land. So let's begin. We'll look at Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11, beginning in verse 1, clearly, guys, clearly the context of this prophecy is the age of the Messiah, the return of Jesus when he will be on the ground ruling from Jerusalem. Verse 1, it says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Now, the image that's used here is it's conveying or portraying the Davidic royal dynasty. The Lord promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7, in the Davidic covenant, he promised to David, he said, someone is going to rule on your throne forever. Okay, so they were expecting it to be from David forward unbroken. But really, just a few generations after David, the kingdom was split between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And then, of course, the Babylonian uh, invasion happened, and the king was, I mean, his children were, his kids were slaughtered in front of him and his eyes were gouged out and he was taken away as a slave to Babylon, right? So like the Davidic dynasty is like a tree that was chopped down. So you have this stump. And then this picture here at the beginning of Isaiah 11 is out of the stump comes a shoot. Um, in the landscaping business, we refer to these as volunteers, right? You cut down the tree, but it's still alive. The roots are still alive. And this tree begins to grow up. And really 10 years later, the thing can be a complete mature tree. 
I mean, depending on how long it takes for the tree to grow. But here's what's neat about this, is this is clearly referring to Jesus, the Messiah. He is both the shoot that comes up out of the stump, he's also the roots. He's described as being both the shoot and the roots. He comes both before and after David. So that's just an interesting analogy that can easily be missed. It says the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of the knowledge of the fear of the Lord. It goes on, clearly referring to the Messiah. Skipping forward, with righteousness he will judge the poor. He will decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. The essence of the kingdom of God, when Jesus returns and establishes his throne, his kingdom, is the kingdom will care for the poor, the afflicted, the needy. It will be the kingdom of justice. This is a theme that permeates the prophecies concerning the messianic kingdom. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Paul later quotes this and applies it specifically to the Antichrist. When he returns by the breath of his mouth, he will kill the wicked, the Antichrist, and the Antichrist followers. The wolf will, we're all familiar with this imagery, the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard with the young goat. The earth will, this is one of my favorite passages. I love this picture. The whole earth will be full of the knowledge of, of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, as the waters cover the, the, uh, the landmass at the bottom of the ocean, as the oceans bury those things, so the earth will be covered, permeated, saturated with the knowledge of God, with the knowing of God. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. Even the Gentiles will be turning to the king on the throne in Jerusalem. And he will stand as a signal for all of the peoples, for all of the Gentiles. And his resting place will be glorious. I love that. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the teaching, but we wanted to make you aware of a gathering that we're hosting in Dallas, Texas, July 13th, 14th, and 15th of 2023. It's called the Maranatha End Times Summit. You can go to maranathasummit.com for more information. It's going to be a very powerful time together in the Word, going deep in the subject of the end of the age and the return of the Lord. We hope to see you there. Go to maranathasummit.com for all the information, details, and registration information. Skipping forward to verse 11. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people. So here's what people do is they quote this verse, the Lord will recover a second time, and they go again. Babylon was the first time. Rome was the second time. The Lord has recovered Israel a second time. You'll see this passage quoted in Israel if you watch sort of... Um, patriotic videos about Israel. They'll quote these, and here it is in our day. It's been fulfilled. And it's very inspiring. It goes on uh, among his people who remain from Assyria, from Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam. It's from all over the world. They're gathered back, even from the islands of the sea. The Lord will lift up his standard. It's like a, a flag. He lifts it up high so people can see it from a distance for the Gentiles. He will assemblish the banished ones of Israel. They're gathered together, the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So here's the question. Here's a passage that speaks of the return of the Messiah. His resting place will be glorious. When Israel was reestablished in 48, Jesus did not come back. There was no return to the Lord. There was no reestablishment of the throne of David in Jerusalem. It was just a return to the land. The context of this entire prophecy is the return of Jesus, the return of the king, the establishment of the kingdom, the salvation of his people, and the gathering of the remnant of Israel from all over the world. Okay, that's clear, and that's easy to see. The question is, but how do you explain this statement, the Lord will recover them a second time? It's actually much simpler. Um, it's a, actually a very easy answer. The answer is, at the time that Isaiah was prophesying, the first Babylonian exile, it hadn't happened yet. The only exile that Judah, uh, Isaiah was in the southern kingdom of Judah, the only exile that they had to look back to was the exile to Egypt, 400 years as slaves in Egypt, which was ended with the exodus. 
Okay, that was all there was. So when the Lord says a second time, he's not including Babylon. He's not including Rome. He was looking back and saying the first exile was when Israel was taken to Egypt. Again, the Exodus brought that to an end as they were brought out, and there will be yet again another great deliverance, another great Exodus, a second Exodus. The Lord will recover Israel a second time, way greater, far bigger than what he did with the first Exodus. And this theme of the second Exodus is actually everywhere throughout the scriptures. Clearly, it's right here. The context, again, is of which is the return of the Lord. So now let's look at Jeremiah 16. We're going to see the exact same pattern. Jeremiah 16, verse 13. The Lord says, So I will hurl you out of this land into the land which you have not known. Again, there's the exile, one of the key components of the covenant chastisement cycle, as we've talked about so much. Jeremiah is just describing it yet again. He says, Neither you nor your fathers new of, of this area that you'll be going, and from there you will serve other gods day and night, and I will grant you no favor. So there is the punishment, the exile, again, which we've talked about is yet to come. And then continuing in verse 14, Jeremiah 16, verse 14, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. You see, there it is. The first time is Egypt. It's the Exodus. So the Lord goes, the days are coming when you're not going to look back to Egypt and say, man, that was amazing. There's going to be something much greater. So there's the pattern. The first time is Egypt. The second time is the return of the Lord. Look at the rest of the passage. But as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north, and as Isaiah 11 said, from the four corners of the earth, and from all the countries where he had banished them, for I will restore them to their own land which I gave to their fathers. Again, the larger context of Jeremiah 16 is the Messianic age. And so we can see this clear pattern that is understood and conveyed and reiterated throughout the prophets. There is one exodus, the historical exodus. Why do we celebrate Passover? Why do we remember? Why do we look back? Why does the Lord command Israel to celebrate Passover? And I know many Christians do as well. So that we will remember what he did, so that we will have confidence in the future of his return, of the second exodus, of the ultimate exodus, of the final glorious exodus, which is when Jesus returns. <coughs> and now let's look at Jeremiah 23, verses, beginning in verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Same theme, same motif that we just saw in Isaiah 11. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice. There it is, justice and righteousness are the foundations of his kingdom. Justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will dwell securely in the land. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. It's a beautiful picture. It's clearly speaking of after Jesus returns. It cannot be used to describe the current state of Israel now. Beginning in verse 7. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt. You're not going to be saying, man, as the Lord lives, remember the amazing things he did when he brought us out of Egypt? No, instead you'll say, as the Lord lives, who brought us up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north and from all the countries where I had driven them, and they will live on their own soil. So again, whether we're talking Isaiah 11, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah 16, Jeremiah 23, they're all talking about a second greater exodus when Jesus will return and rule over Israel as king. So again, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they're just simply telling the same story that has been told a thousand times. They are reiterating, repeating, reminding Israel of the words that Moses spoke back in Deuteronomy, back in Leviticus. Okay, so now in the next session, we're going to say to, to look at passages that validate the current reestablishment of the state of Israel. And that is important because it is prophetic. The current state of Israel is prophetic. It is the hand of the Lord, but we want to base that on the correct passages. So amen and amen. God bless you all. Maranatha.